Welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio, your hosts Chris Honholtz and Richard Story joining you on November 21st, 2020. We're getting closer. We're getting closer to the end of this chaotic year, but it's just still a little ways to go. And well, I don't know about you, Rich, but I don't care what the government says. I'm having Thanksgiving next week. (laughs) How about you? (laughs) (laughs) Well, mine will depend on variables that do not relate to COVID. But um, (laughs) I forget who posted it. It was rather humorous. I think I saw the other day that 2020 came in on Charmin and is going to go out on Whipple. (laughs) Because evidently the the toilet paper shortage is starting all over again. It's it's crazy. I've already seen it. Um, our, Our local Costco was picked clean last week. Uh, Walmart had like a a couple of cardboard boxes that had like six rolls. And that was like, you could see people, you know, hovering around that aisle. Like if you grabbed it, you might get your arm chopped off. So I'm just like, what is wrong with y'all? It's COVID doesn't cause a TP problem. Stop it. <laughs> so, I, I, I think someone is trying to recreate the, glitch that started 2020 i think they're trying to recreate it and make 2020 go out on the same glitch because telling you you can't i don't believe in coincidences and this is so far beyond bizarre for it to happen twice in one year but toilet paper of all things and, and i don't know what the obsession is but it's like you know you get the first glimpse or people get the first glimpse that there might be or they're the stores don't have this or that product anymore. And then boom, you know, you go right back to what we dealt with first of the year. People are buying 15, 20 packs at a time, yeah. hoarding it and putting it back into their cabinets. And, you know, either that or selling it online for twice of what, twice what they paid for it. Well, I, I just want to ask this. Y'all bought this much toilet paper at the beginning of the year. You should be ready for like 2021. What did you do with the toilet paper that you already bought? <laughs> if you're using point. that much, you got bigger problems than COVID. Well, you know, it's a very simple solution. The stores can limit one per <laughs> purchase or one, you know, one per person per purchase and and very easily say that, you know, no, you're not, you're not allowed to buy 6, 12 packs. Yeah, you're only limited to one. I mean, it's very simple. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just simple, and and I think down <laughs> that low. But to me, a lot of things that go on in this country, especially this year, they use just a little bit of common sense. Uh, would not be. <laughs> we wouldn't have issues. See, there's the problem. Common sense is not a flower that blooms in most gardens these days. In fact, common sense is a deceased, extinct, and killed on site flower if it ever shows back up because <laughs> it's well, gone <laughs> and completely unrelated but is actually somewhat related to tonight's topic and i don't know how many people are aware of this or if this is the norm but over the last couple of weeks i sent several inquiries to several different seminaries wanting information about some specific courses and specific classes you know, I wasn't looking at it, doing a full-blown online enrollment, but I was, a couple of classes I was interested in taking here and there. And in that, I just wanted them to email me, like, you know, prices for this course or whatever, or more information on how the program works online. And I don't know what happened. I guess I messed up by actually providing my phone number. Oh, but my no. phone, they have been, the, the admission offices from these places have been absolutely blowing my phone up daily oh are seminaries that desperate needing <laughs> students or what in the sam hill is going on i mean beyond aggressive to where uh, i won't name any seminaries but it is a very very solid very highly respected seminary among conservative christians at one point there were they were like two or three times a day they were calling <laughs> and i, I and emailed me. And I mean, each one of them on top of calling, they've been emailing me daily. And I replied to this one in specific, and I just explained the information that I was 
looking to get from them that, you know, I didn't necessarily want to do an interview over the phone or anything else. I was just interested in some more information. I didn't, I haven't heard back from them yet, but that just blew my mind. I was not expecting just a barrage of phone calls. I mean, is that typical you reckon among seminaries that are that aggressive trying to bring in students or is that indicative of a bigger issue that's going on within American evangelicalism? That's the, you know, that's, I wish I knew the answer to that one. Um, it's it's bizarre. I mean, nobody's trying to beat down my door to get me to sign up for their seminary, so I really don't know, brother. Um, yeah, yeah, but that, you that, that, that might be contact us for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this could be the fact that, that like I said before, there is a reason why it, this show would fail without you around because you you you're really the smarter one. So people don't know that, but <laughs> well, actually, probably do. That's probably why they listen, but. <laughs> They're probably beating down. That's just they're they're going after. They're trying to get you because you're the smart one. They're not trying to beat down my door. But <laughs> yes, brother. Like I said, you did not fill out the contact contact us form. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of doing it. <laughs> they're like this guy. Actually, sounds like he knows the Bible. Get him in here. We need these guys. No, I didn't answer any questions. Or anything. All I did was request more information. That's that. You know, no admissions interview or nothing all i did was request some course information and, and prices and the the mechanics of how yeah. it works how their online school works there was no anything about my knowledge of, of theology or anything involved <laughs> it was just simply me asking for more information and that's my point i mean yeah. it's you know it's like <laughs> worse than these uh extended warranty <laughs> phone calls um, you know, if I had to ask, look at it from the most pragmatic reasoning, um, when we look at what's been going on this year with the, you know, we were talking about COVID and all the lockdowns and all the schools that aren't really having school, it could be, man, you know, if you put in a request for information, they're like, get us a student. We need a student bad. <laughs> so, I mean, if I had to hazard a guess, that might be part of it, but it's, it's, so that's you- information. That's news to me. I wouldn't know. So you think that may be a reflection on the pew packing, especially this year among American evangelicals? You know, I would not be surprised in the very least, brother, not surprised in the very least, because especially as we watch evangelicalism just tripping over itself to cater to culture, and we've been talking about that for years now, um, and especially this year, my goodness, um, the idea that they could be just as desperate to fit, fill the schools as the average evangelical church is to to fill a pew. <laughs> I, I I would say, especially in 2020, I would say, yeah, that's probably a, a good indicator. <laughs> so. well, this, this year has definitely revealed a lot of hypocrisy among the, as the hashtag says on Twitter, Big Eva, yeah. basically the elite among the American evangelicals in our country. Not to say that we do not have some that are solid, Mm -hmm. like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul when he was still living. We're talking the the ones out there on the fringe that, you know, prominent denominations like the SBC, whose leadership now is basically all woke, Mm -hmm. and the um, compromises that has been willing to make when it comes to biblical truth in order to adhere to the demands of a a few people within the SBC and somehow or other either have been convinced or deceived into believing that they must start doing this in order to be biblically correct. But I fear it's more because they're more concerned about being able to keep the giving and the resources as far as money in their coffers like they're uh, you know accustomed to because like with the SBC when it comes to the upper leadership you know all that's done through the giving of churches and state corporations or state cooperations or the state unions you know they, different states call themselves different things like the Mississippi Baptist Commission you know so much of what they bring in typically is is donated to the upper SBC. And I noticed that Louisiana's um, 
ba- ba- so- Southern Baptist Arm of Louisiana, they just recently voted to start cut funding to certain aspects of the SBC, and they put out statements clearly denouncing CRT and um, intersectionality and all of these other topics that everyone's been talking about. But um, that that really surprised me. Louisiana, of all states, being the one one of the ones first ones in the South actually to jump on and, and start denouncing what's being put out and taught by the SBC. But even more concerning than that is the SBC and some of the leadership within it, the way that they have bent this year, especially bent to the way of culture and instead of standing on firm biblical truth, have been willing to compromise in order to remove a gentleman that they deem as hateful. Yeah. And this is your turn to take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, I, I think Andrew will be impressed. Your transition was fantastic. So Andrew is going to be impressed with that. He, he brought that up in our, in our uh, recording that we did with him, that I did with him uh, on his program, that uh, your, your, your transitions are getting really good. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously we're, you know, that is kind of our topic tonight is when we taught, we hat tip toward this last week, uh, we talked last week about language and h- how we speak about the things of God and when we're talking about the gospel and stuff. And now we're talking about this week how evangelicals in America in the lead up to the 2020 election were, in my opinion, playing fast and loose with language in order to... Well, let's just say that writing offense takes on a whole new meaning. Uh, with some of these guys, and Rich, the thing that um, when we when we say big Eva, big evangelicalism, so folks understand, uh, there is we've talked about Christian celebrity before, well known Christians. Uh, you mentioned ones that would be solid yet well known guys like John MacArthur and and R.C. Sproul when he was still with us, people like Steve Lawson or Paul Washer. They're well known, but they are not per se celebrity well known. They're not uh, the glitz and glam all around them. These are men of God who um, just absolutely devoted to preaching the, the gospel. And by the way, um, I can't remember your name, sir, but this is what I thought was absolutely just disgusting: was an individual who de- just slammed MacArthur and others. For their, uh, because they are saying, hey, the state's coming against the church. We're actually starting to face a kind of persecution because the state's telling us we can and can't meet. He slams them because, oh, well, they have no vision. They have no, no grand project that they're working on. And my response to him was, right, because faithfully serving your congregation, ministering the word of God, preparing them to live in a world that hates Christ and to prepare them for eternal glory is just so unimportant. That's that that's the big Eva mentality. The big Eva mentality is like the grand plan that somehow we have this this spotlight that we need to do something with. Uh, we have political capital that we need to play. Um, you know when. Gospel Coalition did that article. Well, do we really want to spend our political capital on whether we should keep the churches open during a pandemic? That was an actual article. That's what I talk. That's what I think some of us are terming Big Eva. These these individuals who see their platform and their their well known status as something more than just, well, I'm known for preaching the gospel and I'm known for pre- preparing hearts and God has used that to expand the reach of what I do. They, that's that's not what they're looking at. They, they, they are trying to use that platform for some sort of cultural um, recognition. And so when we say Big Eva, that's kind of what we're talking about. You, and, and, and this is where I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, Big surprise. Um, <laughs> people like J.D. Greer, people like Russell Moore, people like uh, Danny Aiken, Dwight McKissick, and a lot of these guys, SBC, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to pick on the SBC, 
But these are uh, people like uh, Eric Mason, people like uh, Jamar Tisby. These are individuals that are well-known evangelicals, and they are not necessarily some... I mean, look, I'm going to take heat for Danny Aiken, and I'll explain why. But they're, they're in that limelight, and they're, they're using it for whatever they deem is the culturally relevant thing to go forward with, and they're trying to guide the ship of evangelicalism in this culture's in this water in in the, in the culture's water, and that's what we say when I say Big Eva. That's what I'm talking about. Th these are the guys they want to be seen. They're using that. They see that platform as a cultural uh, impact, and that's what they're using it for. So well, when we see Big I'll, Eva, I'll, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Rich, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say you need to um, add uh, Dwight McKissick to that list. Eric Mason. Ty Betty, um, and I'm sure there are others, but those are some of the mm -hmm. more pronounced voices that write articles and blogs. Mm -hmm. You know, at, not only at uh, Tabidi Anyawiliwe. He's another one we've talked yeah, about at, at the Gospel Coalition. But you know, this, and I've had issues with some of these gentlemen for years, mm -hmm. and it's not just this year, but. Um, at the moment, my mind is blank on some of the other more prominent names um not that i believe he's a christian but you could put lump joel osteen in yep. with that group and so many of the tbn crowd yeah i mean they're the list sadly when you're having to lump leadership of the southern baptist convention with known heretics such as joel osteen you know that there's a huge problem yeah beneath the waters and, and I would agree, and that's probably a topic we can get into on, uh, for another time. But what we wanted to talk about was this year's election, not because we want to get into that whole rigmarole, because, boy, we, we really had fun with that four years ago. And, by the way, as we get into this discussion, Rich, I can hear it now. You guys were very much against Trump four years ago. Yes, we were. I'm going to link a video <laughs> that I did that was our kind of... I'm trying to use things like Facebook Live and Twitter Live and or Periscope, whatever you want to call it, uh, a little bit more. And I did a preview for tonight's show, and I actually explained there has been a progression. And it's not because we're die-hard, die-in-the-wool GOP. You can be rest assured, I have huge problems with the, with what uh, the Republican Party. Um but there's been a pro progression, and part of it is which was what how we viewed Trump as what we believed he would accomplish and what he would not do versus what he actually did and the uh, the things that have changed. So um, just wanted to – there's actually been a progression in our thinking and a reasoning why we – this year, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about who you should vote for, uh, but we both did, you know – advocate for hey there's a marxist movement coming it's unchecked it's an out of control ramrod coming our way and there's a guardrail there that we could vote for that will actually help keep that from happening so um we didn't get into a lot of that this year but that's not because we were trying to avoid it there was just other topics we wanted to discuss and there were a lot of i think good christians who really did uh understand the nature of this and we're discussing about it discussing it. The, the the issue that I had, Rich, is what we saw in the lead up to the 2020 election. We saw, uh, in, in, with the start of 2020, we saw what was happening when COVID hit, when the riots hit, the so-called peaceful protests, when you had people like Ocasio-Cortez screaming for socialism and people echoing that. When you saw Black Lives Matter admitting them to themselves to be a Marxist movement, and you saw the Democratic Party really become unhinged in its support of everything ungodly. And what astounded me was watching big evangelicalism in the, the months and even the weeks leading up to the 2020 election really doing a two-step around this, almost as if they didn't want to acknowledge, some did, by the way, and, and I took a little bit of a lump for Danny Aiken, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Some did speak against people like Biden, 
but still two-stepped around any kind of open support for the incumbent, in this case, Donald Trump. And that's what I thought was just like, wait a second, if some of you recognize what's actually coming our way, you can actually see it happening. Why is it there's not this widespread effort to support uh, the individual who actually is openly standing against these things? And, and, and again, Donald Trump openly re uh, refuted so much. He, he stood against the Black Lives Matter and the Marxism and the critical race theory. He stood against um, socialism and those things. I'm like, why are we not seeing this? And as I looked, it was we were looking at different articles and different things that were posted uh, online in preparation for the show, Rich. I, I saw what I saw as certain reasons why that was the case. It was just like, it, my, my ultimate impression was they just simply could not bring themselves to have any kind of open support for Trump. And so they wanted to leave the doorway open to vote for, even vote for Democrats, because they saw it as impacting that cultural capital that they wanted to use later on. Would you say that's probably a good way of, uh, of, of recognizing that? Yes, brother, I would agree, other than I would add, I, I think there's a lot of different motives going on and a lot of other things going on beneath the surface, one being that uh, money, as always, you, you can trace everything back to money. Of course. That in order to gain support from different areas that they're trying to draw into their denomination or church, they did not want to come right out and and expose what Biden truly believes in, but they've been trying to ride the fence post and pander to both sides. They never came out and supported Donald Trump. They didn't expose the teachings and what the Democrats truly believe. Basically, all they've done is say, well, Biden is not Trump, and Trump is a mean, hateful man, and here's why. Mm -hmm. That's been basically what they've done and worded in a way that leaves someone really can, can, can leave someone confused. Okay, are they supporting Biden or, you know, are they just hating Trump? You know, what exactly are they doing? And I think they were ambiguous on purpose, to I, be honest, when it came to certain issues. I, I absolutely agree. I think um, one the, the first one you mentioned, you know, tr uh, Trump is just kind of a, a very bad person. I, I think the hashtag was orange man bad. And if you don't understand orange, it's Trump's complexion is doesn't appear to really be a natural skin tone. Sorry. Mr. President, but it something wrong with that. Um, but they people would it was that hashtag Orange Man Bad, and as if that was really the best reason to vote for anybody, um, just because Donald Trump had a personality that a lot of people just didn't like. And I understand that, um, despite my support for him this year in terms of the election, I have repeatedly stated. And I've even responded, not that I ever thought he would actually see it, but sometimes he does. I actually responded to things that he posted on Twitter because when it comes to uh, Donald Trump, the one thing the man is incapable of is being a statesman. I'm sorry, he just is incapable of it. He, he loves to keep his base stirred up. He is an arrogant and prideful man. I have said that many, many times. And so the, the one thing, when people say, for example, Trump's the best president of my lifetime, I, I I gotta challenge you. Stop and think for a second. Yes, you 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 voted in a street fighter because you wanted somebody who would be willing to get in there and get his nu nu knuckles bloody. Um, but what does that also cause? It galvanizes the other side. The best president in my lifetime would be Donald Tr or not Donald Trump would be President Reagan. The man knew how to work with both sides. Um, and there are people who will get mad at me for saying, that, no, you can't work with the other side. But the man knew how to unify. He was a statesman as well as a conservative. So he, he is, he's definitely portrayed himself in a manner that angers people, aggravates people. He has huge, massive character flaws, which if you go back to what we talked about in 2016, Rich, I think a lot of that's the stuff that is what was made him problematic in 2016. He was a person who had a very checkered history, very 
disrespectful to women, for example. Uh, made his money in a lot of ways that was ungodly. So no question, those character flaws are extensions of the things that he, the things that he once did. Well, um, I, go I, ahead. I will, I will, I will add this that in 2016 we were also coming out of eight years yeah. of Obama, and in 2016 one of the huge talking points was illegal immigration yeah. and Trump's promise to build a wall and to do things to tighten illegal immigration. Um, he advocated for a strong U.S. economy. Um, he advocated for bringing jobs back to America, manufacturing back to America, to lessen our dependency on foreign countries for oil. Um, he advocated for a strong military and a strong police force. He advocated things that are what the country is designed to do. Mm -hmm. the, the presidency and the U.S. government primary role is to defend our borders and to protect the citizens. It is not meant to spend an entire four years trying to campaign or trying to promote or to pass legislation that's going to give transgender people the same rights as you know, non-transgender people. The, the government and the presidency was never intended by our founding fathers to be used as a cultural um, debate box mm -hmm. and, and pass legislation and pass laws for all these other things. The government's primary role has always been to defend the borders and to protect the people. Somehow, over the last several decades, that has been forgotten, and now it's gone from what we experienced under Obama to this year where there were basically no talking points. There was no platforms. It was just a all out argument. And I think the reason that Trump gained so many supporters back in 2016 was because of the talking points and was because of what Obama had done within those eight years that, you know, galvanized Trump's base because then, at least, most Americans, even some Democrats, did not agree with those Democrat policies. And, you know, we could spend several episodes just discussing what Obama did that I would say was outside the realm of what a president should be focusing on. But to give Donald Trump credit in these last four years, he's we've had a record, I think the first time in history, we exported more oil than we imported. Gas prices have come back under him, came back down to reasonable levels. Um, the U.S. economy was growing and thriving. We were depending less on China. Several major corporations moved their plants from other countries like Mexico and China back to the United States. You know, he did more to try to galvanize the U.S. military and, and ensure that soldiers had the equipment and everything that they needed. You know, Trump, to me, has done what a president should do. Now, when it comes to moral character, if you compare Biden, Biden to Trump in, in moral character, there are a lot of similarities, but yet there are some differences. Yeah. While Trump, in his private sector supported, you know, the homosexual agenda and homosexuality and all the letters that go with that, as president, he has turned back some of the things that Obama tried to implement. Mm -hmm. One thing being uh, Trump has stood against the Equality Act, which is a very, very sinister thing in itself that Biden has openly supported and says that he's going to ramrod down the throats of the Americans once he's officially inaugurated as president. Um, Trump has done, I think, what he could to limit abortion and limit access to abortion. Yes, that is a good thing, people. If you're pro-choice and you think that that unborn baby in that woman's womb, if she has a right to decide whether or not to put it to death, you're wrong. End mm -hmm. of story. Um, I, I said several months ago that I can't see how any true Bible-believing Christian could vote for Biden, but I could see where a true Bible-believing Christian could be confused when it comes to voting for Trump. Yeah. Um, 
My personal opinion of Trump really, truly has not changed since 2016. But as a president, he has done more to try to keep his promises than any recent president has. And he has stood up for religious liberty. He has stood up for free speech. He has stood up for the things that a president should be doing in order to secure his nation's economy and its actual security. Right. No, I, I absolutely agree. And that goes back to why you and I have had a progression in tw from 2016 to now about why we see voting for Trump as actually having been a, a positive thing given what is coming down the, the, the pipe. And I, I want to address that with how some of these evangelical leaders, now that the election's over, have seemingly expressed buyer's remorse, you know? But t going back to what you were talking about, you know, as far as we, we were t discussing with as far as Trump bad, Trump mean, Trump the look at John Piper's article that he wrote prior to the election back on October twenty second. He he talks about why he's not voting for either Trump or Biden, but his article is pointedly pointing talking about Christians who would consider voting for Trump, and he says. Um, addressing abortion, for example, he says, I, he says, I think Roe is an evil decision. I think Planned Paper Parenthood is a code name for baby killing and that, and, and historically, historically, at least, excuse me, ethnic cleansing. And I think it is baffling and presumptuous to, that, to assume that pro-abortion policies kill more people than a culture saturating pro-self-pride when a leader models self-absorbed, self-exalting boastfulness which Trump does, we're, we're not going to deny that, he models the most deadly behavior in the world. He points his nation to destruction, destruction of more kinds than we can imagine. It is naive to think that a man can be effectively pro-life and manifest, manifest consistently character traits that lead to death, temporal and eternal. This is, I believe, what Big Eva mindset was. Trump is just arrogant. He is not nice. He doesn't speak well of people. He says things that, well, at least sounds racist, or he sounds like he's he's uh, sexist. Yet, look at what he has done versus how how arrogant he sounds. You know, I, I, I get it. Trump sounds like a terrible person when he gets on Twitter. And when he gets off script, he is he loves to mix it up. That first debate was a nightmare. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to deny it. But this was, I think, the biggest underlying thre uh, thread of the, the, the entire discussion was Trump not nice. You can't vote for Trump. He's not nice. He's a mean person. And so I, I really think there's a lot that motivated that. And I think that when we start looking at uh, all these other issues um, that we were that you and I were discussing pre-show, that's the un first underlying issue. Is they there were those within evangelicalism who just couldn't bring themselves to give. And I'm not saying, by the way, I, Rich, neither you or I are saying that evangelicalism has a duty to endorse a president. But if you're going to get involved in the mix. Pick a side, you know. Pick, you know, be willing to pick a side. Don't and own and own it and own it. If you're absolutely if you're own going it. to pick a side, you need to own it. If you're going to step out and say, "I think Biden should be president," own that. If you say, "I think Trump should be president," own it. But don't play this flounder, flip flop, back and forth, yo yo, slinky mentality to where you're trying to straddle the fence and point out how bad Trump is. And not necessarily endorse Biden or give people a free pass on voting for him and, you know, just kind of wallow right there back and forth. But that's what most of them have appeared to do is mm -hmm. just like what you said in that article. They point out how bad Trump is, but yet there's nothing said about the Democrat platform and what mm -hmm. may be the ramifications of a Biden presidency. Well, and that was one of the things like we saw throughout the, the lead up to the election with that with uh, T, uh, TGC t together for the uh, the Gospel Coalition. Excuse me. T, um, some of their articles. It, it was like, oh well, you know, Christians, you're going to have these conversations around the dinner table, and and young Christians, you're going to look at your parents and not understand how they could possibly vote for Trump. 
And yet there was no discussion of the flip side of this, right? It was it was almost as if the accepted vote was going to be that Trump was bad and you had to you had to learn how to deal with Christians who vote bad. And really kind of like, well, let, what are these other issues that we need to discuss? And let's talk about all these, let's talk about social justice and all these things. A lot of this stuff coming out of Gospel Coalition, but nothing that stood up and said, by the way, the ideology of the Democrats is patently anti-biblical. <laughs> so that was that was one of the, the first thing. The second thing was we, and we talked about this, and I know the guy's over at Just Thinking, massively talked about this and continue to do so, was the, the acceptance of and, and the promulgation of social, social justice ideology within the evangelical church. Look at uh, people like J.D. Greer. I mean, J.D. Greer, it, it just recently, he was, uh, he, he's giving a, uh, a talk, not so much a sermon, but a talk at, um, oh, I'm forgetting where this was at, uh, da, 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 da. I'm looking at the article, so bear with me. But he was he was giving his talk, and he was ta- uh, you know talking about this one particular clan uh, in the Old Testament that had not gone out to fight, and uh, the 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 people of Israel judged them because they didn't stand up with the rest of Israel in this fight, which is we see that throughout the Old Testament. You know there were there were uh, clans or. Uh, uh, the, the tribes that would not raise up and stand with the people of Israel because they didn't want to get involved. And in, inevitably, Israel turns against them and, are, and they judge them for what was wrong. And, and that's true. That, did, that does happen. And then he does this twisted, contorted grasp where he says that the church has not gotten involved in in things that we should have stood up for, such as he put it, um, standing up for, you know, where's the quote? Uh, a world where everyone can thrive regardless of gender, gender expression, or sexual orientation. Okay? Talks about gender justice. Talks about racial justice in this thing. And these have been talking points. Oh, here it is. Here's the quote. Whether we're talking about racial justice or gender justice or what have you, tra- tragically, there's often been a malaise in the church because the injustice did not directly affect those of us sitting in places of privilege. Like Mara's, it did not affect our tribe. That was that was J.D. Greer. And he's been championing this and kind of playing fast and loose with his language, saying things like this. I mean, talking about how God shouts at, at, at a religious hypocrisy, but whispers about sexual sin. Remember remember that quote, folks? You know, when he was saying that? You've got people within evangelicalism who want to import this idea of systemic injustice, be it uh, racial or be it gender or whatever, and you have people like J.D. Greer who are championing that and laying that groundwork that when we're when we're thinking about an upcoming election, what are one of the big things we need to think about? Well, we need to think about we need to think about social justice. And you, we mentioned Dwight McKissick earlier. You know, back on October twenty sixth, he he puts out a tweet uh, responding to somebody uh, whose tweet is no longer available because his account's closed down. But he says systemic injustice and qualified immunity are equivalent of pro-life issues. If you're a victim of either, which many minorities are, he he's championing, championing the idea that to be a Christian and to be pro-life and stuff like that, you have to be worried about social justice. And as Christians, as we have spoken up and said, critical race theory is ungodly. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter is Marxist and unbiblical. You had individuals like this, J.D. Greer, Dwight McKissick, and others, who were uh, Tabidi Anyabwile. Well, if you if you call if you refer to CRT, you're talking about a an you know it an uh, an invisible boogeyman that doesn't exist. Rich, this was being laid down through all of 2020 by people with high ranking evangelicals who promoted this. And this was become became one of the big issues as we went into the election that you were that you had to care about social justice. You had to care about 
systemic racism because if you didn't care about that, you weren't loving your brother. You, you, I mean, am I wrong in this? Were the, do you see this the way no. I do? Go ahead. I, I, absolute, I absolutely do. And without a straight talk, without coming right out and saying it, many of these <laughs> big Eva types through blog posts, Twitters, articles, you know, you name it, have not directly came out, come out and said that you as a Christian, you must support social justice issues, but they have worded things in such a way that implied that Trump was a racist and we mm -hmm. should be supporting social justice issues and the Democrats support all of this. So we need to be sort of supporting this because we can't just sit back and be silent on all of these issues. Um, most of those issues are first unbiblical, second are not things that should be deciding a presidency. Refer back to what I said earlier about what the job of a president and the government actually is. It's not all of these cultural and social type issues. Um, in the 1960s, yes, that was true. Yes, that needed to be addressed. But guess what? Laws were passed. Um, Affirmative action was passed. Um, guess what? Things have changed since 1965. I'm sick and tired of these leaders, regardless of what party or denomination or whoever, I'm sick of them trying to rehash what's already been settled. Um, first, you're never going to end racism in this country by enacting laws or social justice or anything else. There's only one way you're going to end racism, and that's through preaching of the gospel and begging Christ to save lost souls. That's the only way you will end racism, because racism is nothing but hatred of the heart. And Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. That's the only way to end that, period. Yeah. First and foremost, as a Christian, that should be what you understand, that all of these laws and all of this fighting back and forth between parties is not going to accomplish anything in the light of eternity. The only thing that will do that is begging Christ to save those that are unsaved. As Christian leaders, they should understand that more than anyone else because they have been pastors, teachers, leaders in, in their quote-unquote churches for numerous years. You know, They profess to know Christ. They profess to know by the Bible and theology. They should know more so than anyone else what the duty of a Christian should be and the separation of that when it comes to politics. And, you know, granted, a lot of people have said, well, we're not voting for a pastor-in-chief, we're voting for a, a commander-in-chief. I see both sides of that argument. The real question remains, especially for this, cy this voting cycle, should have been, and it should have been addressed by these leaders, who will do more to protect religious liberty? Who will do more to protect the freedom for Christians to read their Bible, to worship God, to go to church, to do what we're commanded by the Bible to do? But yet they go off on this wild tangent, preaching and commanding that people submit to social justice and submit to woke theology because, you know, a hundred years ago, your forefathers enslave these people. You, you owe them something. You need to be doing more about it. And not only that, they have gone so far as to imply that if you're not speaking against these issues, you're supporting racism. Yeah. And that's exactly it. I mean, let's go back to Dwight McKissick again. I mean, t just two more tweets of his that I, uh, you know, just in my mind, expose that kind of thinking. I mean, one of them was back on October 23rd. Uh, when he was sharing, uh, responding to someone, he says, children of color were prominently featured at two points in last night's debate. Once uh, when brown children had been snatched from the arms of their parents and once when black children were being warned about the threat of police brutality. Lord have mercy. McKissick responds, true. I have seven-year-old granddaughter horrified and I have a seven-year-old granddaughter horrified at the thought of being a victim of police brutality having watched the footage of George Floyd. I have no reason to believe, absolutely none, that the mentality exhibited by Floyd's abusers will improve under Trump. So again, taking that 
systemic racism, taking one incident, broadening it out. We've talked about this before um, and saying that under Trump, it would actually get worse. You know, making that ra- you know broad racism claim that, that, you know, that police brutality, which statistically has been shown time and again to be inaccurate. Um, but yet, uh, you know, banking on that and then goes uh, one further on, oh, well, this is, uh, I think, around the same time, October 22nd, he says, I'm pro-life, pro-traditional family, compassionate immigration advocate, and anti-police brutality slash pro-justice advocate. WEC, he, he explains later, means white evangelical church, wants, to, wants us to support their efforts to influence legislation leading to anti-abortion laws while showing little support for anti-police brutality and pro-justice. So again, that whole argument that Oh, you, you you like Trump because he's pro he's pro life, but you don't want to support all this, which is it, it's an absolute uh, you know redirect because what he has alleged as far as what's going on in society and systemic injustice, etc., is a debate a debated issue, but it's being promoted with by an evangelical who has a wide platform and who is shared by. You know who who has interactions and is shared by Danny Aiken, you know Southeastern ba- uh, 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 Baptist Theological Seminary, and he has a loud voice within the SBC, and I don't mean loud like you know uh, some sort of negative term, just meaning that he's he's heard. He, he has this broad platform, and he's arguing police brutality won't get any better under Trump, and you white people because he says WC means white evangelical church, uh, you don't care about uh, black people getting hurt by cops or you don't care about social injustice. So again, laying that platform that nothing would improve under Trump and using that as a way to say you can't vote for this man. And I'm going to get back to Dwight McKissick because there's something that comes up in a conversation with Danny Aiken that I look at this and I think, how dare you, Dwight McKissick, Say what you later say about Joe Biden and his platform after the election, after saying things like this, because there's there there was a way to prevent what Joe Biden intends to do. So, I mean, th- those are some oh, things there. Uh, go ahead, brother. I just want to add this and, and I'll let I'll let you have at it for a little bit, because I think I know what's about to transpire. But um first, and I'm asking you this, Chris, and I'm asking our listeners. When is the last time we actually had a truly Christian president? And I, I'm not talking about one that agrees with us morally. I mean, a president that we would actually think was a true believer in Christ that stood on the Bible, stood on the Word of God, that did not compromise to, you know, the Democrats or the left or the world, but a truly, truly Christian president. I can't name one in modern history myself. Yeah, I think the closest Not one that I think the closest we would ahead. come might have been Reagan. The closest that we would come to it. And I'm not and, and I'm not saying he was spot on. I'm just saying he's the closest. Well, I would agree with that to a point, but um, you know, I've I've read Reagan over the years and there's a few things in there that mm-hmm. were kind of questionable. But Reagan was back what in the nineties? Eighties. Eighties, excuse yep. me. Yeah, that's right. He was back in the eighties. And that's several decades ago. Mm-hmm. And you know, since then, like I said earlier, it's not a matter of who the best man is to serve as president that will do what his job job description actually is. It's turned all all of it's turned into these social issues and like you were saying about the brutality by cops against blacks which by the way was not an issue until obama took office if you take exception to that i've got Mm -hmm. scores of links and data that i would be happy to share with you but honestly systemic racism did not become an issue until obama took office and that's only because he made it an issue yeah he opened the floodgates on that Yes, I will stand on that till the day I die. That, yes, racism existed prior to Obama, but he took something that at that point in time was a small issue 
and inflated it and turned it into an issue that really wasn't there. And since then, more and more people have jumped on that bandwagon. And I think one of the problems is that, um, you know, people are concerned about America turning into a socialist country. Well, guess what? We've been a socialist country for decades Mm -hmm. because the problem is this younger generation does not understand what socialist means. They don't understand the definition in political terms. They think socialists are people that are advocating for social justice, and that's not the case. And I think that is one of the problems because we've got two or three generations now below what you and I are that look at look at these issues and don't really understand the terminology because I don't even know how long it's been since civics has even been taught in high schools or junior highs, junior high schools, but they don't understand these terms because they haven't been taught American history. They haven't been taught civics. They haven't been taught the Constitution or government or classes like you and I had growing up. And now they look and they hear the word socialist and they think, oh, yeah, that sounds great. The government's going to help all these poor people. Oh, great. The government's going to provide free health care. Oh, great. All these rich people are going to have to pay more of their share to help all of us out here that – you know, we're struggling and, and working week to week just to get by. Oh, that's great. Socialists, oh, they, you know, they, because it's got the name in it, that means that they're advocating for social justice and equality for people all across, across the country. No, that's not what it means, not in political terms. And that's part of the problem is that we have two, three, maybe even four generations of edu- uneducated people when it comes to civics and government history. Mm-hmm. You, would you agree with any of that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this the, that was one of the other things when you went, I actually had a person challenge me on why I should vote Democrat because, well, Democrats care for the poor. Democrats don't care for the poor. They make people, de- they make the poor dependent upon the Democrats. That's an entirely different issue. But it's actually one of the things that you saw. I mean, when we're talking about social justice issues, like they, they, they think, oh, socialism is, is, is social justice. That's what they're saying is, well, there are people who are without, so the government needs to get involved. And well, Republicans, especially people like Trump, they would never do that. They just, they want to give tax breaks to the rich, which actually promoted more employment because the businesses had money they could reinvest in their companies. Big shock. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? When when a when a CEO of a corporation is used to getting a ten million dollar bonus a year and taxes rise, he's going to do everything he can to keep getting those ten million dollar bonuses, mm-hmm. even if it means laying off people. That's what raising taxes on corporations and the rich does. Because, and I, I'm, I'm not knocking anyone, but I'm just stating the fact that when you're used to a certain income, regardless of whether it's $5 a week or $50 million a year, when that income is threatened, you're going to do what you need to do to ensure that your, your style of living is not affected. And sadly, when it comes to corporations and multimillionaires that own companies, um, their, their, their pocketbook will come first. And mm-hmm. they will lay off people if they have to. But guess what? When when tax taxes are low, and they can they can make what they're used to making, and know that they can create more jobs and that their business will flourish, knowing that because of these low taxes, they can expand and hire more people, and that means that their income is actually going to increase. That's that simple ep- economics. I mean, just plain boil down. That's plain simple economics. That you know. When it comes to income, people are not do not want to make less than what they're making. Exactly. And when it comes to rich and corporations, the more money they have to reinvest into their own company, the more money they have to invest in expansion, they will hire more people. Mm-hmm. And guess what? The government actually brings in more tax dollars through all these people working than it does through super high taxes on these corporations and rich people. Mm-hmm. I've often I've often said, and I still stand behind this, that the 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 best thing that could have ever happened for this economy in the last sixty years would have been a flat a flat tax across the board, because you could have just about have done away with most of the IRS, and you could have done away with you know so many tax lawyers and 
all these other loopholes and everything else, just a flat tax across the board, that would have generated more revenue for this country and solved more problems than everything else that's been done when it addresses taxes ever could. And I still stand behind that, but I don't think we'll, we'll ever see a flat tax other than if some some certain individuals keep in power and take over, um, maybe a 50% tax on everyone, regardless of what your income is. Uh, absolutely. And, and this is one of those things where it's like, I'm trying to think of the best way to, it's a failure to recognize what was really happening, what was really being accomplished by this president in favor of these other issues. And it's, you know, you can't, you can't be pro-life if you're not social justice minded. Social justice uh, is important. Oh, if you're not doing these things, you're, you're in favor of racism and this president is racist. That's what so much, so much of these, these articles that came out, um, so much of these posts that came out from uh, these big evangelicals, and were so supportive of the idea you just couldn't vote for President Trump. And that was the problem. It was late. You don't have to come out and say, how dare Christians vote for Trump? You, you don't have to do that. You don't have to come out and say, you better vote for Biden. What you do is you lay the foundations to create a certain thought process that you guide. And when you give a steady diet of social justice, socialistic-minded, Marxist-minded thinking to people, and then up comes the election, and you start talking about these things, and you start talking about, wow, he's terrible, he's mean, he's not saying the right things, you are guiding how people think. You, you are capable of guiding and manipulating how people think. And that for people who are stated as evangelical leaders to adopt such thinking that you know, it's not enough to be pro-life. You have to be pro-social justice. It's not enough to want to put people back to work and pr so they can provide for their families. You you have to uh, provide all, all all these socialistic programs. It's not enough to just be against racism. You have to tear down a structure and rebuild it with so all these things fall into place. That was the steady diet coming out during from big evangelicals during this upcoming election and had been built upon in years past all the way up to now. So people like... I have a question. Go ahead. No, finish your, finish your I, sentence I just, and I, then I have a question okay. for you. So, I mean, when you're dealing with people like J.D. Greer, McKissick, and John Piper, and who people who can who are now claiming, which I'll get to in a minute, who are now claiming how terrible you know Biden is and how we'll stand against him, where were you in the weeks and months before? Where were you when you could have been? And I, I, again, I'm going to take a lump for da on Danny Aiken, but I'll explain in a minute. Where were you when you had the opportunity to tell Christians, here's what the man's accomplished. He's an arrogant, prideful fool in some cases. But here is what he has done to protect religious liberty. Here's what he has done to protect life. Here's what he has done to stand against the uh, flagrant immorality of, of things like the Equality Act and LGBTQ support and all this stuff. Where were you for those things? Because you didn't want to take that ground. And that's why I think we ended up where we were. Now go ahead with your question. I'm sorry. All right. Do you think American evangelicalism and these individuals and, and the other ones in their camps, do you think they, this year they compromised the gospel and traded it for politics? I, I think, let, 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 me, let me share a couple of quotes with you here. Um, back on October 22nd, Tabidi Anyabwile shares a quote, and he gives it the little fire emojis as if he totally buys this. 
and from a Kurt Kennedy. I see many Christians expressing their concerns about the future welfare of our country. I see very few expressing their concerns about the future witness of the church. Beth Moore, October 19th. We have burned down our evangelical witness. Sound familiar? Burned it to the ground. But here is what I know. I know God can bring beauty from ashes. I believe he will raise up a people purified by the very fires we set, a people defined by Jesus himself, not denomination nor political party. Do I believe evangelicals traded political position for the uh, gospel for political position? Absolutely. I really do. Why? Because you have people who say, because if we supported Trump as evangelicals, we were burning our Christian witness to the ground. What? All right. <laughs> hold on. A hold on a second. So if I supported a man who stood in favor of life, if I supported a man who stood for religious liberty, if I supported a man who stood for the uh, defending the borders of our nation, if I stood for a man who stood against, so not entirely because he's compromised in some of these areas, but stood against at least a lot of the push of the EL LGBT crowd, stood against flagrant Marxist socialism. If I stood for that because his tweets are crass, he has a bad personal history uh, before becoming president, and he sounds bad when he talks about holding people accountable that come across the border illegally, I've burned my witness to the ground. Rich, that is saying we want a, a uh, we want to be able to set the po political platform of the evangelical church because we want to be seen as not l looking and sounding like Trump. So yeah, I actually believe they did. Okay, the next question, which I have a comment after you answer, but why, what motivation would the American evangelicals, what motivation would they have for not standing for Trump, but basically standing for Biden, what motivation, what are, what were they hoping to accomplish? Um, you know, reading between the words, what is the root motivation behind all of that? Well, this is where we get a bit speculative, but I think we can get, I think we can get kind of close. I think it boils down to this. I think you, it's trying to uh, uh, put oneself in a position of having a quote unquote high moral position. We, we were biblical enough, and I put that in quotes, we were biblical enough, we were godly enough, again in quotes, to not want to vote for Trump because he's a terrible person. And so I, I stand opposed to someone who speaks the way Trump does. I stand opposed to so, uh, the, the, the type of person in history he's had. And therefore I can kind of elevate myself as being above him because I've taken this particular stance. I don't have to vote. I don't have to promote Biden to do that. I can just tear down Trump and say he's a terrible person. We really ought not vote for him. And then I think there's a flip side to that. Then when Biden takes his stance, um, I think we can, um, I think we can then uh, put ourselves in the limelight, so to speak, as standing against Biden. Now, mind you, Biden never once hid his agenda. This man on television said he would fight for eight-year-olds to be able to take uh, hormone-blocking drugs so they could... A, a child at eight years old, you don't let them pick what cereal they're going to get, okay? You don't let them set their bedtime. You don't let them, to, you know, to go on the internet unobserved, I hope. Um, you, you don't let them to go play out after dark at eight years old. But yet Biden says at eight years old, they can choose what gender they're going to be and they can choose and he will fight for their right to choose whether or not to take hormone blocking medications so they can later have their body mutilated to, de to determine their gender. This man said he would ingrain Roe v. Wade in federal statute because it's never been done. It's a, it's a, Roe v. Wade is a Supreme Court decision. He wants it in federal statute so that it can't be reversed easily. 
This is a man who said he would expand abortion access and revoke the Hyde Amendment, which prevents government money being used for abortions. He was public about this. I'll add to that. He also advocated, and still is, that when it comes to homosexual issues and transgender, that it will be included, will be included in that Equality Act and the mm-hmm. revisions he and Pelosi and other Democrats have made to it will not only expand it, but I mean, it will absolutely gut Christian liberties because mm-hmm. he plans to take the 1965 Civil Rights Act and use that as a framework to include transgenders, to include homosexuals, whatever letter you want to put out there. Mm-hmm. He's exactly. Made no, he's made. He's not hit that at all. Kamala Harris for years, not only just recently in some articles, but back when she was a district attorney and at, during other times, she has advocated for the legalization of prostitution and using some very, very worldly means of wording to defend that stance. That as a DA. She would not prosecute the prostitute, but she'd go after the pimps and the johns. Exactly. She truly believes that prostitution should be legal, that whatever transpires between two consenting adults, the government has no business in enforcing for as legality, that it, it should be you know, wide open that if a woman wants to charge a man you know, to, to have relations, that that's perfectly okay. That's between them, that it can be regulated under the health departments and and using the framework from other countries that has legalized prostitution. All these other arguments, which are ungodly and unbiblical, but yet we have American evangelicals jumping up and down and clapping for Harris and Biden, um, among which, very disturbing, was a group called Pro-Lifers for Biden. And it was they on their website, they list the 1600 signatures they received from supposedly leaders within American evangelicalism, basically saying we can we can work with Biden, that even though he's for abortion, we can compromise on this one time because all these other issues are a lot more important. Um, I think I sent you a link to that article. There was very disturbing their write up Mm -hmm. the way they were discussing Biden. But I, I agree with everything you said, but I think when it comes to certain individuals, especially within the SBC, the, the reasons why go more basic. And I still believe, and based on a lot of things I've read, it just comes straight down to money. The SBC as a whole is losing money. Yeah. They've got to find another revenue stream and guess who they're pandering to, mm-hmm. the woke crowd. To all these other people out there that are anti-Trump, that are pro-Biden, they're trying to ride that rail to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the Bible in order to bring in more dollars. Yeah. Just like what I was talking about with the basic economics. And as it applies to American evangelicalism, they're more afraid of offending man than they are offending God. Mm -hmm. And I had jotted down a note that I sent to Chris and I just kind of ran it by him just to make sure it wasn't too hard. But this is honestly how I feel when it comes to Amer- American evangelicalism today. It's prostituted itself by chasing after strange and deviant teachings of demons. And the teachings of the Democrats are the teaching of demons. Anybody that supports homosexuality, supports the murder of unborn children, you're supporting the doctrine of demons. And they're, the, the American evangelicalism... To me, as a whole, when it comes to all these people and topics that we're discussing, they look, look excuse me, they look more like a whore on a big city street corner that accepts money for whatever perversion that will fill its coffers. They're willing to compromise the gospel in order to make sure that that revenue stream keeps coming right on in. And claiming to be woke, American evangelicalism has become biblically broken and shattered. And I think... Romans 1 applies to them, especially in this day and age. They claim to be wise, but they become fools. And I see them as Esau, 
-hmm. They traded a glorious inheritance for a moment of pleasure, sitting in power and position, not wanting to sacrifice things of this world for things of Christ. They remind me of the leaders during the New Testament. They knew Christ was king. They knew Christ was the Messiah, but they were more fearful of losing their status and losing their standing with the Romans than they were acknowledging Christ and obeying him. Yeah. And I see that as the basic root, primary strip everything away root thing that's going on within American evangelicalism, not just with politics, but like with the SBC compromising and, and with Lifeway, Beth Moore books, Joel Osteen books, T.D. T, uh, T. Jake's books, all these other social issues that they're compromising on. Uh, like you were talking about Greer coming out, talking about uh, gender justice and all these other type things, instead of wasting the opportunities they had, whether they used Biden or Trump as an example, they could have come out and said, these, these two men are wrong because they stand for this, this, and this. That's not the gospel. Here is the gospel. They did not do that. I have not seen that done once by any of these men. All they have done is, is used words and, and double talk to be ambiguous on their stance. And instead of saying, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible teaches, which is what a preacher is supposed to do, they're saying, this is what social justice teaches. This is what we need to be adhering to. Yeah. They have lost the understanding of what biblical justice is versus the way the world defines justice. And yeah. that is so, so saddening. And I feel for these men and I pray for these men because I think they have forgot some of the basic principles the Bible teaches as it applies to teachers that they're going to be held accountable for what not only they teach, but for what they do and say. Um, I think it's in, is it in James where it says those of us who teach be held more accountable uh i didn't have that i didn't have yeah, that see, one uh, yeah i think that's paul that's or not that james paul. that's paul that says that and you're going to make me look it up while, while you keep talking keep going <laughs> well i've i've got a great quote from daryl harrison who we love that by lord the lord's providence i did not plan on using i just for some reason i had saved this and i came across it today during um going back over the show notes but I think it really applies. He wrote, No truly regenerate Christian should be of such loyalty or allegiance to his or her political ideology that victory is coveted at the expense of truth and integrity. To possess such a mindset is to mock God who knows the secrets of your heart. And he quoted, and he re referenced Psalms 90, verse 8, and Galatians 6, verses 7. But I also would like to add, and hope that our our evangelical leaders will remember this that in hebrews 11 verses 24 through 26 it stated by faith moses when he was grown up refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of god than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin he considered the reproach of christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And I think, sadly, we have many, many, many among American evangelical leaders today, they're more concerned about the treasures of Egypt than they are about the rewards of eternity. Amen. And for, for the record, Rich was right. James 3, 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know will you that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So he was right, I was wrong. It was it was James. Um no, I absolutely agree with you. That this is what bothers me that the the training for political platform in my opinion. The training for using the platform to grow ministry, to grow uh numbers, to grow wealth, whatever it is the motivations are. It this is where I'm going to take my lump for Danny Aiken. Back on November 8th, now mind you, this is post-election. Danny Aiken posts, posts, I have grave concerns about Joe Biden restoring transgender access to sports, bathrooms, and locker rooms. It's unfair and dangerous for biological males to compete again 
uh, to compete again biological females in sport. I think it's supposed to be against against biological females in sports. It's unwise and unsafe to do the same in bathrooms and locker rooms. It's hashtag wrong. Now, I and a lot of others got very frustrated with this because it's post-election. Rich, you and others pointed out to me that there were pre-election posts where Danny Aiken took Biden to task. So I will take the lump for that. Here's my problem. I'm not entirely convinced that Danny Aiken was not doing what we've been talking about this whole program. Because you go back to October 22nd and you've got, uh, uh, what's his name? John, uh, I'm getting my names all confused. I have too many links open. <laughs> John Piper's article. Danny Aiken shares that article. Now, he doesn't give commentary. He's a retweet from James Merritt. But that's an article where that article is taking, not by name per se, but specifically taking President Trump to task. And all the votes that even, all the reasons evangelicals are talking about voting for Trump, Piper is taking apart. And Danny Aiken shares that. Now, to also, me, Danny that, Aiken make. Uh, I'm sorry. I, just, I think this is relevant. He he makes no. He does not hide the fact that he is very good friends with J.D. Greer. Yeah. That he supports Greer. He constant. I mean, you go through his feed, you'll see where he oh, yeah. retweets Greer constantly. So, I mean, he's supportive of it. He's he's sharing people like Greer who are just woke as woke can be. And. He, oh yeah, he talked tough about Biden, but almost nowhere do you see any kind of support for Trump. Now, just because he didn't say I support Trump doesn't somehow make him anti-Trump. I agree. I, I I accept that. In fact, he was very very positive about the appointment of Amy uh, Amy Comey Barrett. Great, but you go through his feed, and I think it speaks volumes when there's like no acknowledgement in the weeks leading up to the election, that Trump was doing things that would have been good for religious liberty. No acknowledgement. Sharing an article by Piper where he says, voting for Trump is is just as bad for the church as voting, you know, as, as uh, being voting for someone who's in favor of abor uh, expanding abortion. And then he shares this. Okay, great. So this is where I feel... People like Aiken and others, and this is what I'm looking at. This is how I'm reading it. I'm just me. You, 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 you got to do this math for yourself. But I'm just, I'm just speaking for me. This is the the fence writing that I'm talking about, where it's like I now get to stand up and say, well, I couldn't vote for Trump because he was just such a bad guy, but I will stand against Joe Biden. Dwight McKissick, going to use his name again, mind you. Did absolutely, and I'll share something he says with James White with, after this tweet. Dwight McKissick, in response to Aiken, says, "Once I read the document that makes it evident that uh, that makes it evident that indeed that's President uh, jo, uh, President Elect Joe Biden's intent." I'm trying to read it. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's how he wrote it. I plan to fight this with every fiber of my being. The evangelical church across racial lines ought to be able to stand together and oppose this matter. Thanks for speaking out. Hold on a second, Mr. McKissick. You were like adamantly anti-Trump. In fact, this is how I know. Because James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries, who has not made good on the show, <laughs> made good on doing a show about my not liking Elf. Yay. <laughs> I was so thrilled he didn't do that. Um, but he says, in response to McKissick, every person with the slightest serious of mind knew what Biden Harris have promised to do regarding transgenderism, homosexuality, and abortion. Every single one. How could you forget uh, Biden said transgender rights are the human rights issue today? So he's taking McKissick to task. He's saying, what do you mean once you read that document? Everybody knew this because it was completely public. What's McKissick's response? 
Trump's lack of pandemic management, uh, management, misogyny, racism, and human uh, inhumane immigration policy, and general lack of integrity and apathy in addressing police chiefs' affirmation of police brutality, I find equally as appalling. Full stop. This is being able to say, Trump bad, don't like him, he's racist in nine, whole nine yards, despite what he actually did as president, I find him appalling, but I'm going to stand against Biden. This is having your cake and eating it too. And that's what I believe this, is, this boils down to. This is having your cake and eating it too. This is, I get to be able to pander to the people who absolutely hate Trump and I get to pander to, to culture that called Trump every name in the book, some of which was warranted, not most, but some of which was warranted. And I get to stand on this kind of sort of moral high ground. And I buy some credibility with the culture. I've bought credibility. Trump was a meanie. Orange man, bad. So I've stood against him. Now I've bought myself some political capital. And now when I turn and speak against Biden, I get to use that political capital. That's what I believe happened here. Whether so it's... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so it boils down to this. Um, obviously, you just provided an example of hypocrisy. So the question remains for... McKissick and all these other evangelical leaders that were saying, hey, Trump, but now we're going to fight against Biden. And we didn't realize this is what Biden advocated. So they were either completely ignorant or they're just completely lying. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the problem is and I don't believe you can say you didn't know. McKissick is confronted, and I know we kind of picked on McKissick today, but he was his were some of the more obvious ones. There were other ones I wish I could have found. That it, it, I, I I'm going to have to be better about bookmarking things like tweets and stuff for the show, because there were some things like the pro life issue, which that's a topic for another time. Pro life, and you have to be to be pro life, you have to be social justice. It's driving me crazy. I spent I don't know how long today looking for it. I could not find it. Um, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of those tweets have been deleted by now. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But to sit there and act as though, to say, well, when I read that document, as McKissick did, McKissick knew full well what Biden was going to promote. But McKissick spent weeks talking about racism, social justice, how Trump was terrible, the whole nine yards. I, I, and again, I will take the lump for uh, about Aiken. I, I will take that lump. Yes, in the weeks prior to um, the uh, you know the election, he was saying positive things about Barrett, negative things about Biden. I'll take a lump for that. But I will also point out, as we said, he is a fanboy of of JD Greer, who is woke as woke can be, and sharing articles by people like John Piper, who said Trump bad. That's to me. That's playing both sides of the fence, and it's because you're looking for political capital. You're looking for that recognition that will then you will use that brand down the road, and that bothers me a lot. Because, Rich, let me just make something clear. Because we we've talked about how there was so much verbal manipulation in 2020 of promoting woke social justice Marxism within the church about playing fast and loose with what it means to be pro-life with, Hey, uh, let's ignore things that Trump actually did. And let's focus on all the, 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 the hot takes that came out of the media that make him look bad. All this verbal manipulation, we've talked about how that happened within the, the high ranking, uh, high rank and file of evangelicalism and that they had an opportunity. You're, you're saying, well, we're going to stand up against Biden. You had an opportunity. There's this guardrail. It's called the existing president of the United States who was up for election, who was standing against those things. None of them wanted to promote that. None of them. You got people like J.D. Greer and others. Oh, well, we, we need to stand against white supremacy after the, the, the first debate. 
you know, saying, oh, well, the, the president didn't clearly state he, he was against white, uh, white supremacy. Yes, he did. The, the, what was said was completely manipulated, but guys like McKissick and Greer and others totally used that. And so we, we should be able to speak clearly. We should stand against someone who doesn't, you know, stand against white supremacy. Total manipulation. Total manipulation of what was said. They could have stood the ground. They could have said that's not what he said. They could have stood and said this man has done this and this and this. He's he's taken care. You know he's provided more jobs for uh, you know for black community than most presidents have in recent history. He's uh, you know he's promoted the health and welfare of this nation. He's promoted Americans first. He's protected religious liberty. He's protected lives in the womb. They could have said all those things. They weren't. They're playing fast and loose. Now what are we not saying? That if a person was personally opposed to voting for uh, Donald Trump, that somehow they're not a Christian. No. Do I have any reason to believe that some of these guys are not Christians? No. I'm not saying that they're not. I'm saying that we watched within the, quote, Big Eva movement, a, a gamesmanship for political capital for money, for recognition, whatever you want to lay it down for. But it was a it was gamesmanship. And then to basically be told that if you to read an article like John Piper's and read things like what uh, Beth Moore and others said and, and the be on your wheelie is sharing that we've burned our witness to the ground because we stood alongside someone who did actually defend what makes America a, a good nation, stood for constitutional rights, stood for protections of life and liberty. That's gamesmanship. And then to turn around and say, oh, well, we're going to stand against this ter terrible thing that Biden has, has said, he as if it's a brand new revelation, as if no one ever knew. Please do not misunderstand, Rich and I. If you genuinely had a conscience issue, and I, 2016, that's how I felt about him. If you had a conscience issue where you could not vote for Trump, hey, you listen to your conscience. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. That was what Luther said. It's also, according to scripture, to go against conscience is to sin. So if you had a genuine conscience issue, you just couldn't do it. If you genuinely believe that the person you did vote for was the right person, by all means, go ahead. I'm not going to tell you you must vote for this man. But Rich and I wanted to point out, there was a grand scale manipulation that has gone on really since last year. And it started with things like bringing in social justice into the church and laying that groundwork that undermined an election for the evangelical vote. And you know, Rich, you shared an article with me out of, uh, uh, New York Times, written by Michael Ware, and I won't get into it, but it you know it's this Michael Ware, uh, according to the New York Times, is he served in the White House as part of Pre President Barack Obama's faith-based initiative, and he's a senior advisor to Not Our Faith PAC. He talks about how Biden worked to win evangelicals. Evangelicals are being sold a bill of goods if you think voting for Biden was a good idea, you've been hoodwinked. Because that man is going to endorse every godless ideology that the church has fought against for 2,000 years of its history. He's going to bring that into this nation. But what I have a problem with are people for purposes of political capital played fast and loose with their words and wanted to manipulate Christians into believing that it was it was a good thing to vote against Trump. It was it was a perfectly acceptable to vote for the party that is godless in every single one of its plat it's almost as if they went to the Bible and went, what are all the sins God's hate? And that's now our party platform. I have a problem with people who do that. I'd like to add one thing before we get too far along. 
um, when you were talking about the evangelical leaders, I do doubt the salvation of some of them based on their fruit, based on what they've shared, based on what they have taught. Yes, I do doubt their salvation, and I pray that they truly come to Christ and submit to him and are truly saved. But one thing to me has become evidently clear, that if things hold as it is, and Biden is sworn in as president, this time next year, they're going to, they're already starting to voice their voter remorse, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And like you said, or or speaking or coming out and speaking against Biden and claiming they're going to fight against what Biden is supporting. But I don't believe it. I really don't. Not for some of them. I truly think when real persecution comes against the true Bible believing body of Christ in this nation, they'll have absolutely nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. They'll go right along with the status quo and, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, the Constitution and freedom of religion and everything else. But you know what? They, the Democrats, especially the left, the liberals, socialists, Marxists, whatever label you want to put on them, they are very crafty. Mm-hmm. They are of their father, the devil, who is the reigns king of when it comes to cunning and deception. They will do it in such a way that it will not, quote unquote, violate the Constitution. But unless you agree with this, this, or this, you could lose your nonprofit status. Unless you agree with this, this, or this, you're going to be taxed more. There are ways around everything. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I don't know if my mind is just warped or I've watched too many movies over the years, but I can see these scenarios taking place because they've already started taking place. And I'm going to, I'm not a prophet. I'm just, I'm going to say something right now and someone say this time next year, bring it back up and tell me whether I was right or wrong. I'm going to tell you what hap- what's going to happen if things hold through and Biden is sworn in as president. Um, for the first six weeks to two months after he's sworn in, the COVID crackdown lockdown is going to become more strict and more prevalent. I mean, they're going to try to make it a national mandate. There'll be states that fight against it. They may end up in court over it, but he's going to impose a very, very strict lockdown. And then they're going to pass the COVID relief package that Pelosi blocked because she asked for millions and millions for museums and all these other non-related COVID type issues. They're going to pass another relief package that will be released after about two months. Biden and Harris will be taking victory laps, claiming that they fixed what Trump could not fix. They're going to claim that they, through their efforts, did away and ended the COVID pandemic. And then a few months after that, they they are going to declare that they fixed the economy that Trump broke. Because by natural, natural order of things, you know, when the, when, when this massive lockdown comes, the economy will tank. And then once it's lifted, two or three months, the economy will reset and they'll take a victory lap claiming that they fixed what Trump broke. You mark my word and you hold me to this, but I just about would almost guarantee if it's not exactly like that, it'll be something very similar. In the meantime, they will use the lockdown, the pandemic, COVID, and implement for your health somehow or other, they will implement this perverse equality act. And it's very likely that by this time next year, if you are a nonprofit or you are a Christian based business, you will fall under the new affirmative action that they will implement that if someone applies for a job with you, you have to hire them even if they are a homosexual and it goes against your faith message, they will mandate that certain religious organizations have a quota of homosexual transgender people. They will implement and do everything that's been done since the 1965 civil rights act, but it'll be done promoting and supporting transgender homosexual issues. 
I have, I believe it with all my heart and soul that that is the way that it will come down, even to the point that somewhere past that, it may be illegal to publicly say that homosexuality is a sin because that's promoting hate speech. It already happened. It has been happening in England for a decade. And you and I both have said for years that this country is just a block away from being like Europe. Well, I think under a Biden-Harris administration, it will jump leaps and bounds to be a mirror image of what's going on in England Mm -hmm. now when it comes to religious liberty and freedom of speech. They won't, quote-unquote, squash your freedom of speech. They'll just redirect it and say, okay, you can say anything you want except this, this, and this because that is promoting hatred. That is being a bigot. That is being racist. And they will use transgender homosexual issues, and they will make it against the law to publicly speak, and maybe even in church, to actually say, the Bible says this is a sin, and it's wrong. They will make that illegal. Yeah. And the only the Lord knows how far they will take it. But that's my stance right now. And like I said, from what I've seen, when real Christian persecution comes or that form of persecution, most of these leaders, they'll have nothing to worry about because they'll, they'll fold and go right along with the flow. Yeah. And, and, and I don't disagree. I, I, I want to make sure people understand. I'm not saying that every single one of these people we've talked about is perfectly fine. I'm simply saying there may be some in the midst of what we've discussed that are Christians but have compromised on one for one reason or another, and if at a minimum it has been for capital gain, or, or uh, for for political capital, gaining political capital. Excuse me. There we go. But I agree with you, Rich. I think there are some that simply there there is nothing biblical about what they've promoted, and their hypocrisy speaks bounds. Um, as far as, well, well, I'm going to stand against Biden now. Well, where were you weeks ago? Um, and and just, just for clarification's sake, Rich and I have always spoken against pragmatism within the church, meaning that you don't compromise the gospel by, you know, uh, having laser concerts and, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, watering down the message and just saying, trying Jesus on for 60 days. We have always, always spoken against pragmatism. So somebody might say, well, you're, you're talking pragmatics now. You're talking about electing a man who was ungodly to be in leadership. Well, let's, as Rich said, point one that was godly in the last you know, 40, 50 years, and we'll talk. We always make practical decisions. You may believe in the sovereignty of God and that everything that happens to you is for God's good purposes, and that's true, but you lock your door at night, do you not? You make decisions about how to live in this life that are practical and sometimes even pragmatic because that you recognize the world that you live in. So when it comes to the issue of elections, we must always, and we we stand by this, Rich and I both do, you must always be a biblically informed voter. You should make your decisions about who you vote for primarily from Scripture. But it also includes who you vote against. When you have an, a party that is 100% dedicated to the promotion and promulgation of everything that is ungodly, and you have an opportunity to stop that with somebody who has proven that he wants to protect some of these things, protect religious liberty, protect life, etc., there's a viable option there. That's the point. So we're not speaking of the church being pragmatic. We're saying recognizing the practicality of the world that we live in, recognizing we do make practical and pragmatic choices, knowing the evil of the world that we live in, informing our consciences by God's word, and that that includes not only, only just who I vote for, but who I am voting against. Make your choices. But what I do not... uh, absolutely will not cotton to is the manipulation of the Christian church for political capital. And that's that's why we felt like we needed to say something. 
because it happened. We watched it happen right under our noses. And there were people well, uh, that, and these guys defended each other while it happened. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. It's, it's going to be interesting, and people pay attention. Over the next few months, sites like the Gospel Coalition and some of these gentlemen's individual blogs and other websites, you're, you're going to start seeing more and more and more put out by them denouncing what Biden is trying to pass, denouncing what Biden stands for. But just remember, these are the same people this year that did nothing to prevent Biden's taking office. Mm -hmm. In fact, they did their best to try to give to convince Christians that they had a free pass to vote for Biden because he wasn't Trump. Just remember that and mm -hmm. watch over the next few months, especially if Biden is sworn in as president for the next, you know, then the, the months following, you're going to see a barrage of articles about this legislation is bad, that Biden is promoting, you know, things that are unbiblical. And it's going to come out, just like Chris has said, that it's going to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that all they've done is, like you said, try to have their cake and eat it too. And then they're going to be trying to be the ones and declaring themselves champions for Christ and champions for the Bible when they did nothing to prevent what could have been prevented. They will be taking their victory laps as well, but they'll be doing it in a way different than what Biden will be doing. Exactly, exactly. So, folks, um, Rich, I think we'll probably get some hate mail on this one. <laughs> I hope we don't, but we'll probably get some hate mail on this one. Um, f please understand, this the whole point of this particular show was not for us to go on a rant against people with whom we dis disagreed. We wanted we want Christians to see that even within the professing Christian church and even within people that we think might be at least somewhat on our side, manipulation happens. It happens for a variety of reasons. And it ought not be the case, but it does occur. We need to be biblically informed Christians at all levels. And we need to recognize that living in this world means we have to be shrewd. We have to be wise. We have to understand that there are those who will use any means possible to prevent the gospel from going forth, and we should never be manipulated into a position where we choose to vote for someone, for example, who will bring persecution against the church. Now, all that aside, let's say that none of this happened, that every Christian institution recognized the threat to religious liberty, to threat to life, the threat, the threat to... Um, you know the 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 moral uh, sexual morality etc. And let's say every institution got it right and they did the right thing. Now what? Well, God is still seated on His throne. The nation of America, as Rich and I have talked about for well over four years now, is not a godly nation. Someone once said, "If God does not judge America." He owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. We are watching for quite some time now God's judgment. Look to Romans 1. God's judgment being poured out on this nation. If God so chooses to judge America, it wouldn't matter one bit how much we stood up behind the right president. If God chooses to judge America, Biden and Harris is the least of what we deserve. The very least of what we deserve. So all of this almost two hours. <laughs> it's, an, it's another Uber episode. Thank you for being with us for so long. 
all of this that we've talked about is secondary to the sovereignty of God and the recognition of the church that we are primarily here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ while he gives us time. Everything that is happening, I believe, is to break the stranglehold that the world has on the church and recognize that our joy and our peace is not in politics, political gamesmanship, political capital. If Joe Biden is the one who takes the oath of office in January, you will see a dramatically different America. I promise you. So will your hope be in somehow overcoming Biden and somehow we can reverse the damage? No. Your hope is where it has always been. In Christ alone. I would encourage you, I think I shared them to the, uh, on our Twitter feeds and uh, on our Facebook page, two messages done by my pastor, Keller Hackbush of Community Bible Church, that he's done for the last two weeks. Because I tell you, the last two weeks I have, and I'm sure many people have, have fought with the sense of dread and despair as we watch what's happening going on around us. Both of those messages are so absolutely beautiful in reminding me and reminding you and everyone else where our peace lies. In fact, if I, if, if I remember when I put the show up for uh, into Podbean, I will try to remember to find those and put them in the show links as well. Listen to those. This program was to help us to remember that even within the professing church, political gamesmanship happens. And we need to be aware of it. And we need to watch out for cele Christian celebrity and uh, the big Eva folks who do play these games, whether they're on our side or not. That was the whole point of this program. But the peace will not be in removing political gamesmanship from evangelicalism. The peace is in Christ who promises, us, promises his church that one day there will be no more political gamesmanship. There will no more be politics. There will not be a president. There will not be a mid-American government. There will not be a separation of powers or a constitution or a Supreme Court. There will be Christ seated on his throne. So while these, these discussions can serve to help better inform our thinking as we go into these issues, that's it. That's all it does. It just helps us think through the issues better. It does not affect our joy or our peace in Christ. Because we may get as a nation what we deserve. In fact, I would encourage you to hit your knees now and pray for God's mercy. Because if we, if, he, if we get what we deserve, Biden and Harris is the tip of the iceberg. Pray for God's mercy. And then, knowing we serve a kind, loving, merciful God who will mete out justice against those nations that turn their backs on him, get out there and preach the gospel because there are people out there who support what the, people like Biden do who think it's a grand and great idea and we hate the uh, the gospel and hate the church and there are people today that if you say I'm going to share the gospel with a Jew who think you're anti-semitic you ought to see some of the exchanges I had the last couple of days good golly it is a wicked and evil nation that we that we live in and yet God has put us here for his purposes so glorify him, pray for this nation, pray for God's mercy upon this nation, and then get out there and share the gospel with a wicked and evil nation facing the wrath of God. Because that's what, it's, it's coming. We are already under his judgment. We are already a people under strong delusion. We are a people given over to a depraved mind. So get out there. 
and show people where true peace comes from, and that's in Jesus Christ. Rich, we've gone extremely long with the folks tonight. It's nearly two hours, so let's wrap this up. What are your What are your last words to our our listeners tonight? Well, I like to point out that you know it uh, the the quote you see go around when God wants to judge a nation, He gives them wicked rulers. But the other quote I think applies to America more than any others is that. When God truly wants to judge a nation, he gives the people over to the sin that they desire. And that's what we see, because um, regardless of Biden, Trump, whoever, it's sad that over the last 50 or 60 years, America has maintained its number one status as the number one exporter of pornography throughout the world. But yet, this nation wants to claim it's Christian. It wants its sin, but it wants Christ too, and it doesn't work that way. Your opinion doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what God actually says and teaches. And we need to remind ourselves and professing Christians daily that we need to compare our lives. We need to compare what we say against the holiness of God because we will never measure up. It's only through Christ that we are even accepted by God. And we need to cling to that and remember that. Throughout this country, there are so many that profess Christ and claim that they would die for Christ, but yet they don't even, they're not even bothered to read from Christ, but yet they profess to be Christians. They never go to church. They never read their Bible. They never study their Bible, yet they claim to be Christians. I have run across more and more than I could ever count when, it, when I was still able to get out and, and go into the world, so to speak, and share the gospel. I come across it now sharing it online. And if you doubt what the heart of this people truly is like, sign up and go to the Kentucky Derby Outreach with Sports Fan Outreach International. You've never experienced the heart of the world more so than attending one of those events. Mm -hmm. And I just cannot put into words the depravity and drunkenness of what some of these people actually act out and what they say and what they think. And yet this country claims to be a Christian nation, but yet it does not honor Christ with its lips. But just keep that in mind as you progress and remember that we can never argue anyone into heaven but we can definitely share the true gospel, explain words like believe and repent, and explain it biblically. And remember that just because we use the word believe doesn't mean the person you're talking to is going to understand it in the context of the Bible. Because every person will define that differently. We've got to be accurate in our gospel presentations but we've got to be presenting and sharing the gospel and not only sharing it, but those that you share it with, we need to be praying for them and begging Christ to grant them salvation. But as you go forward, whatever you do, make it a point to share the gospel at least once a day. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, thanks for hanging in for, like I said, a, a nearly two hour program. Um, talked about a lot and, really tried to lay out what we saw happen and why that was a concern. But as my brother Rich said, the primary thing you are to do is you make, make it an effort to share the gospel, to get out there and proclaim the gospel, because whether we have a great nation, a terrible nation, good leaders or bad leaders, we are called to be faithful to preach the gospel. And I think that's an extremely important thing that we cannot forget as we, as we wrap this up. You go out there and you find someone who needs to know Christ. Because this, this year of 2020 has proven, if nothing else, how desperately our nation needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And start in the pews of your own church. Amen. Amen. The, the fact that we can have people right now who claim to be Christians... And look at things like the Equality Act and think, oh, 
how terrible we have to treat people equally and they claim that's that that the equality act is just that e treating people equally and they reject any notion that it is an abomination recognizing you know uh, uh, legalizing enforcing and celebrating that which god hates rich is right within the very walls of your church pastors don't assume people sitting in your pews are saved Make the gospel s such a, a a central part of what you sh uh, what you teach each and every week. Christians, share the gospel. Teach your children. Teach your children now while you have the opportunity, because there's coming a day when you teaching your children the truth of God's word, the fact that things are sinful, and that God will judge people for it. You will be held accountable by a godless government one day for this. Equip them now and equip them to do so in the future for their children. That is so very important that we do that. So, thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us nearly two hours of your time. Uh, apparently some of you listen to us on chipmunk speed. Uh, I, I, I don't know how y'all do that. I, I can't comprehend when you do 1.5 or 2.0 speed. I don't know. That blows my mind, but you guys enjoy that. I, I, hopefully that got you through the program faster, but thank you. And, uh, we pray that this has been helpful and has caused you to think about these things. And even if you disagree with us and you're always welcome to. Just because Rich and I said it doesn't make it gospel. <laughs> You're welcome to agree with us. And you can write to us, voiceofreasonradio at gmail.com. You can agree with us. Be polite, be respectful, don't be a troll. Um, and we may just be at an impasse. We Maybe we don't agree with one another. Doesn't make you any less my brother and sister in Christ. And I hope you feel the same way. But whatever you do, take it to the word of God. Take it in context. And then put it to work. So thank you for being with us. God bless you guys. We'll see you next. Oh, before I forget, before I forget, I almost, I almost signed off. Next week is Thanksgiving. Go visit your family and eat turkey together and be thankful. Rich and I will not do a new episode next week. We're going to be with our families. Uh, somewhere after Thanksgiving, we'll probably throw up a, a, a rewind episode because... Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we like to share, and, and hopefully it's beneficial to you. Uh, we did one from earlier this year, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I, I know it spoke to a few of you because it got a lot of downloads for uh, comparable, comparable to a, a normal rerun. So we will put one out. It'll just, uh, it, but it will be, it will be a rerun, and uh, we want you guys to think this week. No matter how crazy all this conversation was, be thankful. Because God has given you life and breath. He's given you his son. He's given you salvation. And one day, we don't have to put up with this anymore. So be thankful this week. Enjoy your time with your family. God bless you guys. We'll see you then. Take care. Mm -hmm.